Remember when Ruin was a thing? Yeah, that was a long time ago. When Android just came out, it was a pretty lacking operating system. Even Symbian was more complete than the first versions of Android. That probably stems from the fact that Android was originally designed to be an operating system for cameras. But with the release of the first iPhone, that all changed. Android did 180 and in less than a year it became an operating system for smartphones. That meant the first versions of Android were not, let's say, the most complete. So to make up for the lack of functionality, Rootin was born. Or more like, unlocked. Think of it like getting admin rights on your computer, as Android is actually based on Linux. Only you have to dig deep into the computer to get admin rights. But it wasn't all about functionality. Many times it was about making our phones run better and faster. Early Android smartphones didn't have the best hardware, and Android itself was not very polished or optimized, unlike iOS or Symbian devices at the time. Early Android adopters probably had a clunky phone with like 500 megabits of RAM with a single core processor that would choke just trying to navigate through the system menus. One of the worst things playing Android even to this day is bloatware, be it Google, Samsung, or carrier bloatware. But unlike now, our phones didn't have enough power to run all those things in the background without lagging like it was the end of the world. And this is something that has dealt great damage to Android because many people still have that image of Android being clunky and slow. And sure, the interface, the icons, the menus, and even the boot animation of the first versions of Android didn't help. I mean, the look of the old interface was the stereotype of what people thought looked futuristic at the time. And in a way, I do think it looks cool. But let's be honest, everything is extremely dated by now. Then we have to factor in manufacturers pumping phones into the market like there was no tomorrow. Samsung alone launched over 30 models in 2013, many of which were just slight variations from one another. And that made it very difficult for them to keep track of everything, and many times they just launched the phone and forget it existed. Like the Galaxy Ace or Galaxy Y or even the Galaxy S3 Mini, which didn't get any updates. This massive neglect and lack of software support was enough for the nurse to say, if we don't do it, nobody will. These heroes that didn't wear capes like to hang out in places like HDA developers, HTC Mania, and even YouTube. They already share with the community all the things they found, from troubleshooting simple stuff like how to install an APK, to modding, tweaking, and custom roaming. So when I want to root a phone or install a custom ROM, Usually it's YouTube the place where I head to, because they already give you the information in a more digestible way. The first time I wanted to install a custom ROM was on my Dell Streak 7, all the way back in 2012. And honestly, as a kid who didn't understand a word of English and the terminology used, like ROM, custom recovery, TWRP, CMW, and so many things to learn that I didn't understand. And as expected, I failed miserably to install a custom ROM on my tablet. Only getting my computer and the software to recognize my tablet was almost an impossible mission. Then the software itself that I had to download with my slow internet over and over again as it would rarely work for some reason. And what killed it for me? Those damn command lines. Jeez, I think I didn't even make it past the second line. That was already 4 years in, so I can only imagine how hard it must have been for people to do all of this back in 2008. When Android was just born and when nobody had yet tapped the vastness of Android potential. In the beginning, people didn't even have things like a simple standardized custom recovery to make things easier. It was all command lines from the computer to crack your phone or flash a custom ROM. It was hard for early Android users, and the chances of ending with an expensive break or cause a thermonuclear war were very high. But if everything went just as expected, the reward was worth it. But it didn't take long for custom recoveries to make an appearance though. They were primitive, but they made things easier. With time, they got a lot better and recoveries like clockwork mode showed up. Now you had an interface where you could move around to factory reset the phone or flash things using the buttons rather than lame command lines. I swear I think I still have nightmares about command lines. And even then you still have to mess with them to unlock some features. But one of the biggest game changers was TWRP. Originally developed way back in 2008, it eventually evolved into this super user-friendly touch-based recovery that made the whole process feel smooth and familiar. Now, instead of using the volume buttons and digging through text menus, you could just tap toggles on the screen. Before this recovery got good, doing more advanced stuff like overclocking the CPU and GPU was a pain in the ass. 
but now you just had to flash a file, follow a few steps, and boom, done. It took something that was once hard and made it feel almost mainstream. Greatness was just a few touches away. But as Android became more popular, so did the need for root. And I believe the main reason why people wanted to root their phones was to deal with low storage on devices like the Galaxy Y that, for some reason, had more RAM than storage. All it took was a couple of apps to fill it up completely. I know because that was the reason why I wanted to root my Galaxy S3 Mini, so I could put all the gigabytes of data of my games on the microSD card. But once you start digging, you would find so many other uses, like getting a game like GTA 3, officially made for the far more advanced ARMv7 processors to run on older ARMv6 devices, thanks to tools like Chainfire 3D. That tool really was like magic. Or turning your earpiece into a second speaker for a stereo sound. Or unlocking features we take for granted today, like screen recording or screen sharing. Those were root only back then. Wanting to move your screen to a PC or just capture gameplay? Yeah, root required. So rooting wasn't just a tweak. It was a whole underground ecosystem of hacks and mods that gave your phone superpowers. By 2013, I successfully rooted my first Android device ever, the Galaxy S3 Mini. During the Android Jellybean era, Android was 5 years old, and Android was better than ever. But Root was still must in many cases, and for me, it was plain fun. When I first rooted my Galaxy S3 Mini, the phone was actually fairly good as it was. But I wanted more storage, extra speed, and new updates, so curiosity won me over. By this point, running your phone was no longer a daunting task. I had previously failed to root my tablet only a year earlier, but this time I pulled it off. Not only there were more guides on how to do it, but the tools were more intuitive. All I had to do was download the drivers, the flashing tool Odin, and the custom recovery. TWRP in this case, I didn't even know what it looked like, so... I chose it over clockwork mode just because the name sounded less complicated. I flashed the custom recovery in Odin, got into recovery mode, and finally installed the super user files, and that was it. No boring ass command lines, no weird developer tools. No sketchy guys, just a clean and simple process. That said, I should mention that at some point, even this wasn't necessary anymore. Tools like Framerood, Kingroot, and Towerroot came along. You could just install them on your PC or even your phone and get root access with a simple tap. It was huge for a lot of people, though honestly most of these tools rarely worked for me, so I stuck to the old school methods. Anyway, when I got root access, one of the first things I did was install Chainfire 3D. I honestly didn't know what I was doing, but I was curious to see what it would do since my first option before I went with the Galaxy S3 Mini was the Galaxy Ace, and I knew I was gonna need that tool to run some games on that thing. And as you probably guessed it, I broke my phone. I was angry, scared, and sad. All at the same time. I had been saving money for a very long time. And now my phone was dead. If you didn't break your phone doing something very stupid, you didn't have a childhood. I went through the five stages of acceptance, and finally, after some digging, I got it to work again. All I had to do was flash the stock room that took ages to download. So I learned the hard way that messing with the stuff was dangerous, but I also learned that I could keep wrecking my phone since I learned how to fix it anyway. So I continued with my reckless behavior. 2013 to 2015 were the golden years of running. Getting super user access on your phone was easier and more accessible than ever. Finally, we could get rid of all the bloatware, took our phones to have features Google was too slow or didn't have the interest to implement, we could personalize our phones to our liking, install all kinds of exploits or bypass license checks, make full copies of app data so we could clone it on our devices, and even run games our phones were not supposed to run, and more. But the best part gained the ability to ditch your manufacturer UI entirely, or even better, ditch Android altogether. No more touchways, no more HTC sends, no more bloated launchers with lockdown settings. All you had to do was pick from the countless custom ROMs out there, each with their own distinctive flavor. The first ROM I ever flashed was Paranoid Android. It had everything, themes, pie controls, performance tweaks, a highly customizable interface, you name it. Custom ROMs didn't just give us cool features, they gave us hope. They gave life to devices that manufacturers had long since forgotten. My Galaxy S3 Mini, for example, never got a single update from Samsung. 
But thanks to people like McCloud, I was able to run versions way past the official ones like Android 7. I tested a huge number of ROMs over the years. But my favorite was and always will be Sienna Gmod 11 based on Android KitKat. There is just something about that ROM, clean, fast, reliable, and endlessly tweakable. I'm actually planning to make a full video focused just on custom roaming, so if that's something you want to see, let me know in the comments. Rooting became so huge by the mid-2010s and life was good. Maybe as good as it was ever gonna be. But like with any Disney movie, there had to be a villain. And sure enough, the evil corporations caught on. And they didn't like it one bit. People were extending the life of their phones, skipping over bloatware and what's worse, breaking the chains and taking back control. Control they desperately wanted to keep over you. And okay, being in part fair, having these hordes of people with broken phones after they try to root them probably was a nightmare to deal with. But instead of educating users or offering safer alternatives, they clamped down harder. Samsung, Xiaomi, Sony, and even LG to some extent made it harder or downright impossible to unlock the bootloader. Samsung in 2016 locked the bootloader of some of their phones, like the Snapdragon variants of the Galaxy S7 and beyond. Probably because Snapdragon variants were and still are easier to develop ROMs for, since Qualcomm still releases the drivers of their chips. Carries themselves became more aggressive. AT&T, for example, locked the bootloaders of their phones, so when my Galaxy S4 got Android 4.3, they made it impossible to install a custom ROM. Manufacturers even refused to take in a device that had been previously rooted, even if rooting had nothing to do with the phone breaking in the first place, like taking the phone for a screen repair. Some chipmakers didn't help either. Samsung and MediaTek, for example, don't release the drivers for their chips, making it incredibly difficult to develop custom ROMs for their devices. And then implementation of things like Samsung Knox and Google Safety Net, which made rooting more difficult and gave companies and app developers a reliable way to detect if a device had been modified. All in the name of security. It's always in the name of security. The birth of custom ROMs like Cyanogen Mod scared the living hell out of the big players. And these ROMs were so good they started gaining mainstream traction, eventually making their way into regular phones like the first OnePlus models. Google itself began catching up, borrowing or downright stealing many ideas that were once exclusive to Reddit phones and custom UIs. Features like lowering the notification bar on games, screen recording, and multi window multitasking all made their way into stock Android. App developers didn't stay quiet either. Some apps began locking certain features or flat out refusing to work if they detected root access. Workarounds like Magix were created to bypass this, but by then the damage had already been done. Banking apps started cracking down on root as well, though I'll admit this one is debatable. And then we have that Android and smartphones got so much better that rooting wasn't that necessary anymore. Phones started coming with more internal storage, so there was no longer the need to move the data of your games to a microSD card. A brand still gave you the option to use one, that is. A faster processor also made overclocking pointless. And installing a custom ROM often meant giving up stock apps, like the camera, which over time got so good that losing it became a real downgrade. Developers also started moving on from rooting. McCloud, the developer of so many of the great ROMs I tested on my Galaxy S2 Mini, quit in 2018, and his website actually died not long ago. And with it, all the work and all the devices he saved. What's sad is that people still want his ROMs. I linked his website in my tutorial on how to update the Galaxy S3 Mini, and to this day I still get people asking for a link to a site that no longer exists. Other major players in the ROM scene, like the team behind Pixel Experience, have slowed down or stopped. There are still custom ROMs being released that are very useful, like the one that removes all Google spyware and makes your phone more private, but sadly the diversity of ROMs doesn't even come close to what we had back then. Rooting is still a thing though, but it's no longer as necessary as it once was. I still root some of my devices for things like cloning my apps with titanium backup to have exact copies of my data, or, or disk digger to recover files I deleted from my phone. And of course, to delete useless apps. And the truth is, not many people care about these things anymore. And those who do, don't want to go through all the trouble of ruining a device anymore. So I'm sad to say this, but the golden age of ruining is long dead.
Anyway, tell me what it is. Anyway, tell me what was your experience like when running your phone. Did you break it trying to crack it? Did you have fun playing with things you were not supposed to play with? Anyway, if you made it this far, please comment the word fun. And I'll see you guys. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.